Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at Through Oltan's Door, issue number three. So this is something that was kickstarted during the last zine quest, I believe, and it's part of a series that I've looked at before. I've looked at issues one and two. It's a very ornate, very deluxe, hand-created zine. The paper quality is fantastic. Uh, the art is absolutely top-notch. So I'm very excited to see what we have in issue three. Now, issue three is divided into three parts. So it's like one mega uh, release that's in several parts with a whole bunch of handouts that come with it. So we're gonna be looking through all of that and see what we get here. Links are in the description below for where you can get the uh, print edition from the author's web store or the PDF from DriveThruRPG. This episode is brought to you by Into the AM and their series of sci-fi, psychedelic, and horror-themed t-shirts. If you happen to be running a campaign set in the Dreamlands, they have a whole bunch of different t-shirt options that I think would fit that really well. In particular, this one, the Mind Maze shirt, really looks like someone peering beyond the wall of sleep. Their shirts are very comfortable and very affordable too. Right now, they have a deal going on where for $60, you can get three t-shirts in a bundle. And by using my link in the description below, you can get an additional 10% off. Check that out down there, and thanks to Into the M for sponsoring. All right, let's get back to the show. So what we're gonna do is look at each of the parts one at a time, and then look at all the handouts at the end. So the artwork is absolutely phenomenal. Um, I can't imagine how expensive this was because it's really top notch. It's incredibly detailed, very evocative. It gives that dreamlike feel to it because this is all about being beyond the veil of sleep. You are travelers in the dreamlands. Though it's a very concrete, a very specific dreamlands dreamed up by the author. Um, so each of the covers is separable. That's the same as what we've seen with previous issues of this zine. It pops right off here and you have a map that you can have off to the side while you are running the adventure, which is a nice touch. Uh, it does make the whole zine a little bit fiddly because the cover can just fall off. It's not really attached, um, but that's a bit of a trade-off for getting this nice handout here. So here we have our table of contents for part one. First of all, we have uh, Opium Dreamers, which is a new uh, class that you can get. All the different classes are dream themed. I believe that there's some in previous issues. It's been a little while since I've looked at those. So these are um, dreamers that can enter the dreamlands through taking drugs of different kinds. And so for here, uh, we have an example of different types of drugs that can get you there and the effects that it gives you when you are in the dreamlands. We are gonna be traveling on the Sewer River. This is part of a journey that was begun in previous issues. If you look at our map here, uh, previously we've seen things like Catacombs of the Fleisch Guild or the Inquisitor's Theater. And then later on in issue three, we're gonna see things like Sanitarium of the Benefactors and some of these other places. The general idea here is that this takes place in this floating island, uh, this giant island floating in the sky. And on top of the island is the city of Zion, which we haven't got a whole lot of information about, to be honest. Mostly we've been talking about the area beneath the city, this whole catacomb uh, sewer system. And if you follow this sewer system far, far enough, you eventually come to the Great Falls, which pour out the bottom of the island uh, down through the air, through the white, I think it's called the White Jungle, which is this crazy weird jungle growing out of the bottom of the island. And it's like this inverted forest that you can explore. We haven't gotten um, an actual issue looking at that yet, but I have seen write-ups on the author's blog, which is really cool. So as we continue, continue down the sewer river, we have rules for transit because it is a bit of a point crawl. We're going up and down, uh, going from one interesting location to another. You can always roll on the lay of the land to get information about what this part of the sewer happens to look like. Uh, for example, you could have a brick wall divides the river in two for an interval, punctuated by ruined grills that give glimpses of the other side. So these are like little tactical or little structural changes that can make a difference uh, depending on what encounters you happen to roll. We have an encounter table here, D100, anything from stink cranes to iridescent slugs, uh, oniric puddings, which you can use, I think, to make certain types of potions. Psychic barnacles, floating goods, uh, mold blooms, sewer pirates, the guildless. Everyone in this setting seems to belong to guilds of different kinds, which requires you to wear masks showing your allegiance. Uh, dream bubbles, the little bubbles floating down the sewer. And if you pop them, then you get a sudden flash of a dream. Uh, for example, a majestic red bubble. If you pop it, you have a fleeting glimpse of pursuit down endless corridors by a faceless, inescapable hunter. Fingers fumbling for keys that seem impossible to find. You are shaken and feel bound to fail. Player's next saving throw fails. 
You can run into some merchants, some ascetics, echoes of elsewhere, and a huge sewer worm. Uh, Sophia, I think you say her name is, prophetess of the muddled waters. It's a dragon, but it looks more like a catfish. It's just huge. There's some secret locations, because when you go in between major locations on this map, you can decide that you are searching for secrets, and if you are lucky, you can find one of these six secret areas. For example, a uh, Fen of the Crane May, some interesting NPCs that can give you missions or perhaps cursed items to deal with, the Verdant Purveyor, or the Lair of Sephea. Uh, this one, the Verdant Purveyor, gets fleshed out more in one of the later parts. Wondrous Items, the Diadem of the Crane May, the Manual of Yawning Incantations. This one's really fun. So, for example, uh, there's a lot of clever thinking that goes into the design of some of these items. This one has a case around it with a face that looks like it's beginning to yawn, and the book will not open unless you cast Sleep on the case itself, and then the, the face finally finishes yawning and you can open it. I love little things like that. Potion of Penumbral Transmigration. So this is a potion which you can brew, which is gonna allow you to physically transport things from the waking world to the dream world and back again. I can think of all sorts of crazy strategies that players might come up with for that. And a weird item here. Uh, one thing that is a little annoying is that the contents of these three parts are, well, they're mostly organized, but they often have things that don't come up until later issues or things aren't in the quite the correct order. So finding things at the right time is, uh, can be a little bit difficult. I believe, for example, this dagger doesn't really, you don't find the place where this dagger is until later on. Then you'd have to go back to it. Let's look at part two. This one um, gives you even more information about some of those other locations. Uh, so while the first one was just about what you do while you're traveling up and down the river, this gives you uh, more about the points. Again, the cover comes off. We have the Sanitarium of the Benefactors, one of the main places on that sewer maze. And that's what most of this is devoted to, along with short write-ups of some of the other points. Maladies and afflictions in Zion. So we have things like the furniture pox or the confectioner's dropsy. They all have ways that you can get exposed to it. Like this, uh, you contract it if you have extended contact with confectionaries. And there's a number of processes or stages that it goes through until it becomes terminal, something really horrible. Like this one slowly makes you more candy-like. And when it's terminal, the skin bursts upon, uh, the skin bursts open rather upon pressure like an overripe peach, revealing jellied sweets replacing muscles and internal organs. The victim usually dies from infection as wounds are impossible to bandage and flies swarm the sweet sappy jelly. That's nice and horrifying. Uh, the shadow blight. So this is where your actual shadow becomes ill and starts rotting away. And if it becomes terminal and it finally shrivels up your shadow entirely, then you can no longer understand nuance and you become dangerous zealots. You suffer a minus two to reaction rolls when negotiating or parleying and are generally insufferable. You can contract it if your shadow falls across the shadow of someone who's infected. I love the uh, little bits of dream logic here. I'm going to keep saying it. The art is absolutely amazing. Um, the art is done by a number of different artists. Uh, we have people like, let's see, David Hoskins, uh, Johan Tiedlow, and a bunch by Daria uh, Klebnikova, hopefully I'm saying that name correctly. Just lots of really top-notch artists. Sanitarium of the Benefactors. So this is the main location that we saw inside here. It's a, there's a bunch of different factions there. We have this weird order of people that are running the sanitarium and they're really into uh, self-sacrifice. That's part of how their religion or their order works. So they're sacrificing themselves constantly, but they also don't want you to leave because if you leave, then they can't sacrifice themselves for you anymore. A mutual aid society, people who are imprisoned in the sanitarium who are, uh, who want to escape. We have some people that are actually running it when the benefactors aren't there. They all have different diseases that we've mentioned those before in this issue, and you can contract them if you mess around with them too much. You run into the benefactors themselves, and there's plans for escape. So if you break into here, you can break some of the people out, and they could possibly become very loyal friends. Uh, a number of different encounters, some locations. If you want to actually run this as a kind of heist or dungeon crawl where you explore and try and break people out.
lots of different opportunities for um, interaction with NPCs, for people who like that social interaction. We have the Dam of the Lurid Toads. So this is another point crawl along the sewer where these weird toads have dammed it up and are demanding payment. Um, and what they want is food, and they see basically anything living as food. They have this very ornate, formal way of talking to you. So for example, if uh, you insist that you don't have any fresh meat on board, the toads feign disbelief, asking questions like, do you not trust the testimony of your own senses? Why just look, your vessel contains an embarrassment of riches. Do not display a pinched and miserly character. Or if you would uh, barely meet the requirement of gratitude of the guest, then two of your passengers will suffice. Should you wish to go above and beyond, three would be an exemplary gift. So who are you gonna sacrifice? Are you gonna find a way around this rule somehow? Or maybe you're just gonna fight the toads. Other points of interest along the Sewer River. Uh, these two ones are fleshed out in previous issues. We have the Churning Gate and the Harbor before we get to the credits at the very back. The last issue or the last part of this issue is Beneath the Moss Court. So this is an actual adventure, which is done by uh, Gus L, who's another OSR writer. And the idea here is you're gonna be doing an adventure that takes place in Zion, the city above. And that's also gonna be connected down to things happening in the, the sewer system below, where there is a pirate gang that is, uh, has taken over a little fortress with a sunken boat on it. There's a lot of treasure there. There's people to encounter. There's slaves to rescue. Inside this cover, we have a map of the pirate ship that you can uh, explore and that you can try and uh, rescue people from and get the treasure out of. Fantastic art. So part of this adventure involves dealing with the Zionese justice system, which is very uh, dreamlike, as you would expect, a little bit like something from Alice in Wonderland, where it's not necessarily about having uh, a real justice system as it is about obeying the formalities and figuring out ways to get what you need. So Zionese procedure, if you have full proof, it could be things like an uncoerced profession, that's great, but also half proofs. If you have two half proofs, that counts as a full proof. So maybe you have a dying de declaration of a victim and a coerced confession, that counts as a full proof. And partial proofs are like basically quarter proofs. Two of these counts as a half proof. So maybe low magical evidence shown by testimony or hearsay witness. So by using these rules, you can find ways to build a strong case. Although your enemies can come up with counter cases, because if you have a half proof and they have a half proof that counteracts yours, then those cancel out and you have to find something else. We have some rumors regarding the Moss Courts and some rumor mongers and regulators of the black circle. So this revolves around a particular lawyer who has become famous in these courts because the, his uh, opponents never show up. There's never any opposing witnesses. And that's because he is in alliance with the black circle, which is basically a, ga a gang of cutthroats, of pirates, who are absolutely bloodthirsty and are able to uh, take out his witnesses so they never show up in court. Uh, in return, he's able to help fence their goods. So they're in this deal together. The eminence Milrath Obson is the lawyer, well-built and handsome with elegant and ingratiating hand gestures, often wearing a stylish yellow and blue robes with a matching bar across his smiling beaked mask. The um, language throughout all of these books is very, very fun. It's very evocative. It's a lot of, it's uh, rich. It really pulls you in. Um, there is this um, trade-off though, which we see in a lot of D&D and general RPG books, where when you have a lot of really dense descriptive writing, which is fun to read, is not necessarily the easiest to run. And I think the author has erred on in the first direction um, in terms of making things more fun to read than easier to run. Uh, there is bits later on here where things are broken down by bullet points a bit more, which is nice, but there is just a lot of long paragraphs of text. So this isn't the sort of thing I think that you could run on the fly. You're gonna have to read it carefully and perhaps make notes ahead of time. Um, whether that's worth it to you is you know, up to you. We have the Moss Courts themselves. One thing is that throughout some of these books, we've had a lot of notes about the city of Zion, but we've never actually had like a map of it. We've never had a um, issue that's really dedicated to it. We just keep getting these little bits and pieces, which is tantalizing, but it's also a bit frustrating because for example, if you're gonna have a scene or a part of this adventure set in the Moss Courts, what happens if they leave the Moss Court? 
they're in the city of Zion, but we don't really have anything to run the rest of the city. So you have to really stay constrained within these limits um, or you're gonna have to start making things up real quick on your own. Well, one other thing that I found a little bit frustrating was that there are a number of maps in this adventure, but they're really not in the same place. They're scattered around um, all over the place. When you're talking about the moss courts you use right here, and this little section right here is zoomed in here, all well and good. But then later on, it'll start referring to locations and I couldn't find them on here. And eventually I was able to find some of them on this ship map. But then I found even more locations and I couldn't find those and I spent a while looking for them. And it turns out that it's in one of these handouts. You have to find the correct handout and then open it up and then you will find the locations there. So having these maps spread out over three different places, some of which aren't even connected directly to the adventure, was a little aggravating because it took me a while to track that stuff down. It would be nice if in the book itself, it told you where to find those locations instead of just referring to them by letters and numbers. Uh, some tenants of the Moss Courts with the male and female names. So for example, Ujero or Uliti, the unready, they're calling as a syndicator and a description, ragged and filthy robes. Or you can mix and match to create your own. If you want to try and figure out why this particular lawyer is so successful, you can try and break into his house and deal with uh, his countermeasures, his guards. He has a panic room that he can flee to. And if you find a particular sewer grate in his backyard, you can descend down into it into a channel beneath Zion. And this can connect up to the sewer system that we've seen before. It's one of these secret areas that you can find, although you can get to it from above as well. This is the Wreck of the Burden um, Purveyor. I better show you the map in the handout here. So you have a channel over here, and uh, this channel flows through here and down this whirlpool. But there's a bit of a little fortress right here, and there is a large ship that is partially sunk in the, the sewer here. The pirates, which run this whole area, there's a lot of them. They have a lot of slaves that they've captured and are forcing you to work for them. Um, there's a lot of treasure in here, but it's almost a small army. There's really only two factions, the pirates and the slaves. So if you have a small group of uh, player characters and you just assault this fortress, you're going to be dealing with possibly dozens of well-armed pirates. I mean, they're drunk, but you know, they still know how to fight. And that's going to be, that's going to go badly for you. So you really have to slow down and think tactically. Um, is there a way that you can bring in reinforcements? Is there a way that you can approach this diplomatically? Can you ingratiate yourself and give them gifts, maybe get them even drunker and get in that way? Um, so a game master is really going to have to give the players uh, clues and give them enough information that they know that this isn't a hack and slash adventure. Or at least, you know, hack and slash is unlikely to succeed. Exploring the red channel itself, getting into the Moss Court or the Moss Court Boar, which is the name of the uh, fortress. I found that a little bit confusing. I'm not totally sure what a boar is. This is a very vocabulary intense uh, <laughs> adventure. Reminds me a lot of some of Lovecraft stuff where there's just um, all sorts of fun words that you didn't read before and you gotta go look them up. Rescue some slaves. Don't get sucked down the whirlpool. Even more great detailed ornate art here. Climb on board the ship, either by going up the gangplank or swimming through the uh, gross water and perhaps um, using a uh, rope to climb your way up. Explore the ship itself. Find your way into the captain's um, cabin and I'll find all sorts of treasure that they have stashed there. You can find NPCs that are working for the pirates, one of which was a lot of fun because she is in a coma in the real world. So she's only partially in the dreamlands, which means it har it's hard for things to affect her. You can't do as much damage to her because she's only you know, partially here. And we have a lot of fun at wondrous items at the very back as well. For example, there is a uh, ancient book of martial arts which you can spend XP on in order to learn, which can do things like uh, allow you to learn a new uh, special attack where if you act the very last in a round, you can get plus four to hit and do triple damage. So you have to suffer everyone else's attacks, but then you can lop their head off afterwards. A patchwork grimoire with a number of new spells that you can pick up, including Speak with, uh, speak with Spiders and uh, ABO Genesis, if you wanna generate a whole bunch of little insects. And an aura of hate. 
Um, we have things like a Siege um, Arbalest, which is a crossbow of sorts that has been quenched in the blood of kings and can do a fantastic amount of damage punching right through armor if you really let it loose. Um, the cartography is all done by Gus L and is pretty well done. It's qu pretty readable. I've noticed uh, one issue though is that a lot of these numbers kind of get lost in the cartography. And that's something we've seen before in Through Oltan's Door where I think it would be really nice if you had the numbers and you had them outside of the ship and maybe with arrows pointing back in because when you just scan it and you're trying to look for where's number seven, where's number seven, it's not easy to find. So that is it for Through Oltan's Door issue number three. Um, absolutely deluxe, beautiful work. Let's actually, let's look at a couple of these handouts as well. I almost forgot about that. There is a note on running Siege Adventures here. It's talking about how you would attack that pirate fortress and how to raise the alarm with, of course, the map right there. The encounters are all done on these separate handouts, which is a fun little touch um, because as you're running that particular zone, you, you don't need to keep the book open. You can just have this behind your GM screen, perhaps, and you have all of the encounters right there with all of their stats. Uh, we have some of that for the other issues as well, the three factions, along with the main characters you can find there and all of their stats and encounters for that. And a general encounter card for the lay of the land and um, the D100 table, although it doesn't have all of the stats there. Even more maladies in it and afflictions if you want to have uh, even more weird diseases like mnemonic distemper and um, penury blindness or tempest catalepsy. And there is another location which is kind of like a one-page dungeon, but it's a very large page. Uh, this is another location in Zion, in that city. As I mentioned, there's often particular locations that are fleshed out, but the whole city isn't really completely put together. So here is um, the location, and it's done really well as a one-page dungeon because each of the locations has its description on the side and then it just points straight to it. So just by looking at the picture, you can see how everything fits together. Uh, this location is called the Knowing Bee Sweet Forge, and it says confectionery jostles with opera and gamesmithing for the title of Zion's highest art. Competition between sugar troops is fierce. Once a specialist in narcotic drop candies, the Knowing Bee Sweet Forge was a casualty of shifting culinary fads, eclipsed by the short-lived craze for glacé foams. Behind rotten fences, its overgrown flower garden still sw swarms with white bees, a magnet for honey ghouls, bedraggled aristocrats whose gateway um, are the honey buns served with third tea or medicinal drop candy for og. Ague? I don't know how to pronounce that. Every time they come to ape and resemble, over time they come to ape and resemble their addiction's source. We have um, actual write-ups for the honey ghouls, apian ogres, the gardeners, I suppose you could just create a little adventure right here and run it as a one shot. Uh, so yeah, that's it for uh, Through Old Tan's Door. Absolutely beautiful looking, incredibly deluxe presentation. The paper quality you can tell is also really high. Uh, a huge amount of work was put into the artwork and the writing is really beautiful. The main criticism I would have is that there is some usability problems that I think could be improved by maybe fixing up the maps a little bit and fixing some of the references in the book so it's easier to find what you're looking for. I think that would improve it a lot. Um, but check the description below if you wanna find out where you can pick this up for yourself. And thanks for watching. See you guys next time.